Good everyone, sorry for that, that slight delay. Um, welcome to this afternoon's session. So our first speaker is Peter Lewis from Imperial College, and he's going to ask what do we know about Poseidon? Thank you. Thanks, and thank you to the, the organisers for inviting me to come and talk about um, some, of the, uh, some of the work that I've been doing recently at Imperial with other people. Um, so I'm in the doctoral training centre there, um, and I've been working on ontological models and quantum information processing. So I'm in the quantum information group, uh, and I guess that influences the way in which I look at quantum theory a bit. Um, I, I put this title, but maybe the one that I should have put it um, is, is like this, which has some sort of technical terms in that I didn't know if everybody would be familiar with. So part of my hope is that uh, by the end of when I finish speaking, uh, those who have not come across this material before will know something about ontological models. Um, maybe those who are slightly familiar will know a little bit about um, this ontic epistemic distinction that uh, doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and uh, then there's a, there's a few goodies at the end for those uh, who want to consider themselves enthusiasts in the ontological models program. So, I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing with uh, my supervisors, uh, Terry uh, at Imperial and Chung Barrett, who's here today and usually at Royal Holloway. Um, but actually, most of all, and quite a lot with uh, David Jennings, who's a postdoc in the Quantum Information Group. And uh, <coughs> I introduced all of her people earlier. So, just for completeness, uh, Matt Pusey is also here today. Um, <laughs> And he's, he's the only person in our group who works on sort of foundational things in quantum information. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm going to sort of talk a bit about what the ontological models program is. Um, and part of, the, part of the aim is to work out what we can say about realistic theories of physics. So um, you might take the view that quantum theory is... Uh, to be interpreted realistically, and its elements correspond to, to real things that are out there. Um, or you might take the view that quantum theory is something that's operational, or, or an instrumental view of quantum theory, that it allows us to calculate the probabilities of certain detectors clicking when we have experiments, um, that we have preparation devices that we have with certain settings, and then all that we can really say is uh, the propensities of certain detectors to go click when, when we press go on our experiment. So the ontological models program is one that allows us to <coughs> distinguish uh, things like this in a, in a really sharp way. Um, and we can point to certain characteristics of ontological models, um, which are we take to be sort of the realistic part. Um, and then we can look at uh, what roles quantum theory plays within that sort of formalism. So it's, it's about um, saying as little as possible, I guess, about the, the quantum state, for example, and then committing yourself to stuff formally in the ontological models program um, once, once, you've, once you've gone that, that extra stage. So what is an ontological model? Well, we have some set of realistic uh, or real states that a, a system can be in. So I mentioned earlier this idea that maybe we have these preparation devices uh, that we put with a certain setting, um, maybe the certain setting is a quantum state, and we press go on the preparation device, and what we're committing ourselves to here is that something sort of flies out, and the thing that flies out has a particular state. Um, it might be a quantum state, it might be something else, it could be anything at all, but uh, the set of all the states that it might have is this uh, lambda. Um, so this thing goes flying through the air and it comes across a measuring device and the measuring device we've set up in a certain way um, <coughs> so that it's looking in the quantum formalism at a particular projector set um, and we want to know whether or not that measuring device is going to go click and we associate the measuring device with uh, or the measurement rather with a, a response function so this is a, a function that takes the thing that's flying along through the air and gives us a number between 0 and 1, um, which you might think of as the propensity for the detector to click uh, when the, the system arrives. Um, 
And we have these epistemic states. So um, among the set of real states that a system can be in, we could have some state of knowledge about that. So we might be able to say that uh, the state of the particle is in the left-hand side of the, of the space, or something like that. So we can think of probability measures on that space. Um, and certain of them will correspond to actual quantum states. So um, I'll label them with the quantum state uh, subscript. And particularly to aid your intuition, it's useful to think of these things as like probability density functions. Um, so I'll be drawing some pictures later on, and when I'm drawing those pictures, that's that's very good. Cool. So what do we want? Um, on the left-hand <coughs> side is sort of the instrumental thing that we want to get out. We want to get the probability of a particular outcome obtaining when I use some measuring device on something that I prepared in a particular quantum state. So that's the, that's the probability that I'm after. And the idea is that if I, um, if I do this sum up over the uh, ontic state space, so the, the space of real states, um, with respect to the measure that corresponds to the quantum state, then that would, that would give me the, the same probability as quantum theory, which um, we, all, we all know. So, so what's the role of lambda there? Sorry? I didn't quite understand what the role of little lambda was. Uh, little, sorry, little lambda is, is, is an element of, of this space just here. So um, the, all the little lambdas are the, the real states of things. Um, so uh, the system that's <coughs> flying through the air is in a particular state, and the particular state that it's in is little lambda. So are there any other questions about uh, just this ontological models and what the various components of it are? Good. Um, so. Here's, a, here's a, a particular ontological model that we could have. We could say that the, the real states of the system flying through the air are just the quantum states. So the set of possible states that it could have is the set of quantum states that I might use to describe a system like that. Um, and when I press go on the preparation device, actually I know exactly what state I prepared it in. So my epistemic state is sharply peaked on the, um, on the space of of possible states. And then we can just use the, the, the usual rule as our um, response function. So this is a, a particular ontological model that was from uh, Beltram and Bukowski in 1985. Um, and um, you can see that it works and it has a number of properties. So uh, first of all it's a, it's a non-contextual model. In order to calculate the probability of a particular outcome obtaining all I need to know is the operator associated with that outcome. I don't need to know the entire measurement in order to calculate the correct probability. So this is a, a non-contextual model. Um, it's uh, it's, it's non-local. So for example, if I imagined casting uh, like a Bell test in this, in this model, then I would need to know the state of, of the pair in order to calculate the marginal probabilities. And of course, that thing is a non-local thing. Um, it's also non-deterministic. So uh, if I know the ontic states exactly, um, I can't for sure say that a particular outcome of a measurement will obtain. Um, all I know is, is the probabilities. So um, here are a bunch of things that we're maybe kind of familiar with um, about uh, the way we refer to physical theories. Um, and an extra one that I want to introduce here. Oh, um, yeah, this was a point I wanted to make. So <coughs> you should think of these things as just like fuzzy classical observables. Um, the extra term, as I was saying, that I want to introduce is that this is a, a psi-ontic model. So what this jargon means uh, is that if I know the real state of the system, then from that real state of the system, I can infer what the quantum state was that led to its preparation. So in this uh, particular model, and in models like it, we can say that the, the quantum state is a, a real thing. It's, uh, it's carried along in a little flag by the system as it flies through the air towards the measuring device. Um, 
But we can go a bit further. Uh, so we can, we can imagine a, 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 maybe a genuinely hidden variable model, uh, where, as well as the, the wave function, uh, we also have some extra variables along with it. So in this cartoon here, I've drawn a picture of a set of possible states for a system. And I've drawn three blobs, um, which represent the supports of the epistemic states that are associated with particular quantum states. So for example, if I prepare, um, you know, if I prepare phi, then what I know is that the real state of the system that comes out of the preparation device is, in, is, is one of these in the support of this thing just here. And obviously I know a little more than that. Uh, maybe I have some probability distribution, but it's hard to, to draw that on the board. But the, the significant thing that I want you to notice is that uh, there, are, there are no overlaps between the supports of these uh, distributions. So it's the case that for any uh, lambda that I might get out of a preparation device, if I knew that lambda exactly, then I would also know what the setting was on the preparation device that, that sets it out. So this is what I mean when I say that an ontological model is psiontic. I mean, the role of the wave function is as a part of the, of the theory that I'm uh, into. Any questions on psiontic? Good. Uh, right. Uh, well, using this uh, supplementing of the ontic state space, we can get rid of the indeterminism that we saw in the ultramatic Gamsky model before. Um, and uh, you can do that by augmenting the ontic state space with this extra dimension. So um, let's take the case of a, uh, a, a qubit. So a qubit has a sort of spherical state space that we can uh, we recognize as the, as the block sphere. And my ontic state space, I want to be the, all of the quantum states, so around the edge of the, of the block sphere. And I'm going to take this extra dimension x between 0 and 1. So I've, I've just added, <coughs> if you like, a, a crust on the surface of the, of the block sphere. Um, that red shaded region, uh, I'm not going to talk about. It's not part of the optic state space. For, for the and what we want to do, so what does it mean for a model to be deterministic? It means that if you give me a particular real state, then I can say for sure whether or not a particular measuring device will click for that state. So in the formalism, that just means that the value of the response function is either 0 or 1 for every ontic state. So here's an ontic state space for a, for a qubit. Um, and here's an epistemic state for a particular preparation. So imagine that we do this preparation sign. Um, in this particular model, um, we, set, we, we assert that the, the distribution associated with that model is uniform over the interval 0, 1, directly above the quantum state. So can anybody tell me if this is a psiontic or psi-epistemic model? Nobody can tell me. This is very disappointing. This is a psiontic model, obviously, because these supports are not going to overlap um, for different quantum states. If I prepare phi different from psi, then its epistemic state would not overlap with the, the pink thing that I've drawn on there. So here's an epistemic state, and for my response functions, I do the following thing. I set the length of the support of this 0, 1 function to be uh, equal to the, the quantum probability, uh, or the probability I get from quantum theory, for that detector clicking when I prepare um, the state according to psi. So there's, there's some maths describing what it is. Um, but I can, I can draw a picture of it as well. Um, and if I measure in this basis along uh, phi 0 and phi 1, 
then you can see that the length of the response function above a particular state is just going to be uh, equal to the, the propensities I get from quantum theory for a detector clicking when it's set up to do that measurement. So these are just cos <coughs> squared of half the angle uh, in, the, in the block sphere. So I get the correct quantum probabilities out of this. If I, if I do, do these sums and cancel a few things out, then I'm going to end up with the, the right probabilities. And this is a model um, that uh, Bell came up with uh, and is in his speakable and unspeakable chapter one. Um, uh, so that's that. It's, it's only about a paragraph in the paper, but um, there are things there. So what can I say about this model? Uh, well, it's a contextual model. Um, we've only dealt with the qubit case here, uh, but if we went into higher dimensions, then each outcome of every measurement would have support along some length above each quantum state. And the ends of that length would have to depend upon the other ones. So I'm going to say a bit more about that later. Um, but just for now, this is something to bear in mind. We can say that this is a contextual model. Um, again, uh, it's, it's non-local um, in exactly the same way as we had before. Uh, but we've now got rid of this indeterminism and we've sort of pushed the probabilities in quantum theory into the preparation rather than them being fundamental to the, the measurements that we can do. But it's still, as our quick quiz revealed, uh, silent. So, um, one question is, can we get rid of the, the, the psionticness from a, from a model? Can we have <coughs> an ontological model, a bit like those that we've just been talking about, that is not psionic? Well, let's think about why we might want to do that. Um, if the wave function is not ontologically significant, then uh, a number of things become a bit clearer, perhaps. So, uh, collapse is much less mysterious if the quantum state is not a real thing. Um, we can replace unphysical axioms with ones maybe about information theory and updating and this kind of thing. Um, and many quantum-like phenomena um, can be recovered from sort of toy models that uh, have these epistemic restrictions that render them what we would call um, psi-epistemic. So psi-epistemic is the, uh, the, the rest of the models that are not psionic. And its defining characteristic is the existence of these, these overlap regions that I've shaded in red just here. So if, for example, uh, you peeked at the system traveling along and found that it was in this state lambda zero, and lambda zero is in the, the overlap of the supports of the epistemic states for psi and phi, then you would not be able to say for sure whether the preparation device used to prepare it was set with psi or set with phi. Um, so it's no longer the case that if we know the real state of the system, then we know the preparation device that was used to prepare it. So this is what a psi epistemic model is. Are there any questions about what a psi epistemic model is? Good, I think. Um, so here's the recipe. I'm going to take the model that we were just talking about, um, and I'm going to exploit the freedom that we have in ordering the ordering of the response functions. So I'm going to say what I mean precisely by the ordering of the response functions in just a minute. Um, once I've done that, I'll be able to identify sets of ontic states um, that predict, for example, the second outcome of any measurement that I might choose to do. Um, and of course, what the second outcome means is dependent on the ordering that we've, we've uh, imposed. And then, after I've done that, um, we'll find that the sets in the third point uh, intersect with the epistemic states that we had in the original Bell model. 
So what we'll be able to do is to spread those epistemic states over, over those epistemic regions, I'm going to call them. So um, the, the sets in point three, I'm going to call them epistemic regions. So what do I mean by ordering, and returning briefly to this contextuality point I made above? Um, imagine maybe a Q-trit state, so a state of a three-level system called Psi. Um, and above that state, we have this zero to one interval that we had before. And we have this situation where we want to perform a particular measurement phi, which has three outcomes. What we're going to need to do is to divide that line into three chunks. And the length of each chunk will correspond to the probability of getting the appropriate outcome given the preparation sign. So, for example, if we uh, ask what is the support of the phi 1 outcome, well, you're going to need to know whether phi 1 is being measured with phi 0 and phi 2, or if it's being measured with two other outcomes that have different propensities, because then the, the ends will shift around. So this is what I mean by the model being contextual, that you need to know the complete measurement in order to be able to do this partitioning of, of, of the line above each quantum state. And what I mean by ordering uh, is that it's really just a labeling of the outcomes of, of any measurement that I do. So I'm going to give a prescription for how to order the outcomes of any measurement for a particular dimension of the system. Um, so one thing that I can do is order the outcomes of a particular measurement so that this property holds. So I, I pick a particular state that is in some sense special um, and I order the outcomes so that their propensities decrease um, with the number of the outcomes. So the zero outcome is the one that's most likely, given preparation of zero. The one outcome is the one that's next most likely, and so on, up to the dimension of the system. So here's an ordering in the qubit case. Um, any projected measurement on a qubit, I can think of as uh, a diameter across the, the block sphere. And what I'm going to say is that for any outcome that's a projector onto a northern hemisphere state, I'm going to call that a phi zero. And any outcome that's a projector onto a southern hemisphere state, I'm going to call that a phi one. So, forgetting about the equator, I have a, a well-defined ordering for any measurement. If you give me a measurement, I can tell you which is the zero outcome and which is the one outcome for that measurement. So, We've done these two things. We've taken the, the, the Bell model that we had, and I've given you a particular ordering for any projective measurements that you might do on the, on the qubit. So now we're going to look at these sets of ontic states that give the same outcome for all measurements. So here's a picture that I had before, which shows the supports of the response functions for a particular measurement in this sort of diagonal basis. And in red, we've got this ordering that we just talked about. So now for that measurement, I can, I can say that the projector onto the northern hemisphere state is the zero outcome, and the projector onto the southern hemisphere state is the one outcome. And what I want to do is imagine doing all possible measurements on this qubit, and think about the intersection of, for example, the zero, response function um, as I range over all the measurements that I might do. So if you imagine in your head turning that picture so that the large pink side is pointing left and then rotating it all the way around the top until it's pointing right, um, there is a set of ontic states that you will find is always in the support of that. And that set looks like this. So it's the set of real states of the system that no matter what measurement I do, it will click on the zero detector and not click on the, on the one detector. So I'll call this region the, the zero epistemic region with a curly like that. Um, so more formally, you can 
you can write it in this form. So that uh, that Z just there is is the, the boundary of this pink region at the top. Um, and then the set of ontic states is, is the one that, uh, that, that fulfill this condition. So um, in, the, in the preprint, we talk about this in a bit more detail. So what I've done now, um, I've, I've found this set of ontic states, this set of real states of systems, that whatever measurement I do, um, a particular one of the ordered set of outcomes that I have uh, is always the one that's going to obtain. So we've still got a, a psionic model. We just have a particular ordering for all of our measurements. So the, the last ingredient is to um, look at how we can spread the epistemic states over these sets. So um, the first important thing to note is that if we think about that pink region that we had before, the zero epistemic region, all of those ontic states in there are going to behave in the same way for any quantum measurement that we choose to do. So um, there is no quantum measurement that can distinguish two different ontic states from that region. Can't distinguish the same one time. Um, so here's a picture of the space again, and we've got this pink region of states that cannot be distinguished with quantum measurements. And you'll see that the, the blue epistemic state for that state psi just there, that, that has some overlap with this epistemic region. So we know that all of these ontic states down here in the, the lower parts of that epistemic state cannot be distinguished from each other by any quantum measurement that we might do. And moreover, they can't be distinguished from any other ontic states in the rest of the pink region. So what we can do, oh, here's a picture of them. Uh, I thought I'd make it bigger to make it clear that there is some overlap between these two. Uh, and the overlap is, is up to this point Z that we defined earlier. What we can do is we can spread that epistemic state over the whole of the pink region, the whole of the epistemic region. So we have now two components. We've got the component that we started with, which in some sense is, is still ontic. It's, it's the portion that's still unique, the, the top part still unique to the preparation that we did. Um, and then we've got this other term at the bottom, which puts some of the probability weight onto uh, this epistemic set of states, epistemic region. Um, and that can be any distribution you like, because as we say, uh, we can't distinguish any states in there, so there's no operational meaning to the different ones that you might choose. So, um, we took the Bell model, we put a particular ordering on the outcomes of any measurement, we found this special set of states, and now we've just spread our epistemic states over there, and what we've ended up with is a psi-epistemic model. Why is it a psi epistemic model? Why is it a psi epistemic model? Because now it's the case that any preparation in the northern hemisphere has overlap with that epistemic region, and we've spread that portion of the epistemic state over the whole thing. So they're all going to overlap with each other in that particular region. Are there any questions about that, or more specifically, why it's psi epistemic? Good. So, um, yeah, we have this property that they're, they're all going to overlap for states that are in the, the northern hemisphere, so the zero hemisphere of the, of the block sphere. And it turns out that we can actually do exactly the same thing with the southern hemisphere states uh, simultaneously. Um, it's, it's psi epistemic for this very fact, so I'm just going to rub it in a bit, um, that if you see flying along in your experiment an ontic state that belongs to this set, um, you won't know which of the northern hemisphere states <coughs> prepared it. This is what it means for a model to be psi epistemic. So, um, here are some details for the enthusiasts among you. Um, 
we can do exactly the same thing to find an epistemic region around the, the one state in the qubit as well, at the same time. So we can, in fact, make the epistemic states of the southern hemisphere preparations all overlap as well. Um, when we think about states with higher dimensions, if we go to a Q-trip, for example, um, then we find these little islands of, uh, of states that can share overlap with each other. So in the cubic case, the islands were the northern hemisphere preparations, and the other island was the south southern hemisphere preparations. And in fact, when you look at the higher dimensional case, so in the Q-trip, for example, you'll end up with three islands around the basis of that, of that system. Um, oh, one more thing to say about this is that as the dimension grows, the islands get smaller. Um, so it's no longer the case that all q states have overlap with at least one other q state. Maybe I haven't said that but you can ask me that. Um, this is a, 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 an interesting point, I think. We've, so there's some sort of asymmetry in the model that I've presented here, that we've got these special states, 0 and 1. Um, and that's, that's not particularly nice, primarily because um, the distinguishability of the quantum states has almost nothing to do with the distinguishability of their corresponding epistemic states. Um, there is, as enthusiasts will know, uh, a psi epistemic model for the qubit already in existence, in which the trace distance between the epistemic states uh, matches exactly the trace distance between the, the corresponding quantum states. Um, so one thing that I've managed to do quite recently is to uh, move continuously from the Bell model that I've just presented um, into the quotient specular model. Um, so it would be nice to see, firstly, how this is possible in higher dimensions and how close you can get these two distinguishability measures. Um, of course, we know that you can't get them to coincide uh, for arbitrarily high dimension. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm going to be looking at with, with this soon, um, thinking about the rate at which you can distinguish quantum states and the rate at which you can distinguish samples from these epistemic states, um, which kind of has a bearing on this question, how psi epistemic can a model be? Um, and another thing that's, that's come up recently is that there seems to be some relation between these psi epistemic models and uh, classical simulation of entanglement. So these, uh, these things where you have uh, some shared randomness and some classical communication and you manage to recover the same correlations that you might get through having an entangled resource between two parties. So this is a, 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 a second interesting thing. To, to so um, let's just have a quick recap. Um, you can use these ontological models that I've been talking about to look at the, the role of the of the quantum state, um, and you can you can talk about particular qualities, so the contextuality, the determinism, psionic or epistemicness, uh, without committing to particular interpretations of quantum theory. You can just rely on the uncontroversial instrumental uh, approach. Um, so we can remove uh, indeterminism from measurements in quantum theory, um, as I demonstrated in the first step. Um, and of course, the quantum state can be interpreted statistically. So here's the preprint, and I'll <laughs> cut everything. Um, no. Um, so one thing that we do know, um, this is a result from Renato Renner and Roger Kolbeck, is that we can't have a theory with improved predictive power on quantum theory. So we can't have a theory where, in some sense, your distribution of the outcomes of measurement is more sharply peaked than, than we get from quantum theory. And 
Um, this, of course, has a bearing on this program because it means that, in some sense, the ontic state must be scattered when a measurement happens um, in such a way that you end up with another epistemic state corresponding, I don't know, to whatever the collapsed wave function would be. Um, but beyond that, Um, I think, so they talk about whether or not some extension of quantum theory um, could have improved predictive power, and you can imagine what an extension of quantum theory might look like in the ontological models program, and what it would mean for it to have improved predictive power. I guess that's all I was committing to in my answer to that last question. So for a real question, I, so I know you, you have these disconnected islands in, in the models, and you're just wondering what, what's your intuition about the question of whether you can find a psi-epistemic model such that every pair of models of the states has some overlap. Do you think that's possible or not? Um, well, Terry has shown that this is cannot be done. Um, my intuition about the islands at this stage is as follows. If you have um, so you're familiar with the cauchin specker model. Um, it turns out that the epistemic regions, are, the epistemic region around zero that I pointed out, um, makes exactly the same predictions as the cauchin specker zero ontic state, and similarly for one. So, in moving from this sort of modified Bell model towards the cauchin specker one. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is to find the other cauchin specker states. And you can do that by making your ordering happen on a, a sort of a per-state basis. So the ordering that I've prescribed just here, you stick to that one above 0 and 1, and then you have a different ordering above these states, and so on. And you can actually look at the epistemic states that you end up with there, and then sort of collapse them down onto the cauchin specker ones. Um, so it is possible to move from this model that I just talked about today towards um, towards one that we know is as scientific as it is possible to be in the qubit case. Um, once I understand that well enough, I'll try and do a similar thing with qtrids. Um, and my hope is that maybe this can uh, give us some idea how close you can get uh, to sort of maximal psi epistemicity um, for uh, dimensional systems. Any questions? So, no more questions, let's thank you, Dawson. <laughs>